Welcome to the API Resilience Podcast. If you've ever wondered what it really is we do when we do APIs, and if you've wondered how APIs change organizations, our communities, and our society, look no further. This is the podcast you've been searching for. I'm Christophe van Tomme, and together with my co-host Mark Bergauer and our guests, we explore how deliberate complexity, social practice theory, and a deeper understanding of social technical systems can transform our organizations and the world we live in. Hi, I'm Mark Burgauer. Welcome to the next episode in the Deliberate Complexity series. Our guest today is Jabe Bloom. Jabe currently works as a senior director in the Global Transformation Office at Red Hat. Jabe has been transforming and researching the organizational dynamics and interactions of management, design, development, and operational excellence for over 20 years as an executive, academic, and consultant. Jabe is also currently in the final stages of writing his PhD dissertation at Carnegie Mellon in transition design. We have split this interview into two episodes, and in this one, we talk about how building software within an enterprise is a philosophical argument and how knowing some philosophy can help, what is a pharmacon and what is the Goldilocks space of complexity, technical debt as an example of how deterministic systems can have agency within a socio-technical system, and the origin story of Jabe's model of the three economies, how it helps budgeting complexity and how that is key for successfully building platforms. So, Jabe, how did you came across complexity? Um, I think I actually, in high school, I started reading chaos theory, um, mm. primarily, um, which is an interesting kind of sub-variant of complexity theory, right? Like chaos theory is actually uh, deterministic complexity theories, right? So uh, my favorite kind of version of it is to talk about like double double hinged pendulums, for instance, like a single hinged pendulum. So it's an interesting way to kind of start talking about phase spaces, right? So mm -hmm. single hinged pendulum has a phase space that's a curved line. And that the phase space is just like all the possible places you could find the end of the pendulum. And they're in a straight in a curved line. And if you know the release of the pendulum, you can probably determine roughly where on that line at any point in time. Um, in the future, the pendulum will be, right? But if you have a double pendulum, which means you have a pendulum hanging off of a pendulum, it becomes a chaotic system. And it's because the phase space is then defined by all the possible places the second part of the pendulum could be in. Mm -hmm. And because of the double articulation, um, it's significantly broader um, in space. Um, and also because it can move in a retrograde manner. In other words, it doesn't just swing back and forth. The double pendulum can go backwards while the, the first pendulum is going forwards. So you get retrograde motions. So it means that you can't, all of a sudden you can't predict where the um, pendulum will be, but it's deterministic in that you can predict that it will be within the phase space, right? So it won't ever leave the phase space but you won't necessarily be able to predict where it is in phase space. So I think those are interesting like starting ideas for this stuff. And then from there, a lot of the stuff that I did uh, has, has more to do with kind of philosophy and, and implications of complexity within philosophy, and uh, ontologies, and epistemologies. So, um, and then eventually uh, I think like a lot of people in our community, I ran into um, Dave Snowden and uh and worked with him uh reasonably early in cognitive edge not i'm not like the earliest by any stretch of the imagination but i've been working with their ideas for an extended period of time and then of course from there um i quickly kind of dave used to have on his website a list of books and um one of the things that it's one of the reasons I really ended up like super engaged in complexity theory uh, to the level that I am right now is because Dave did this double thing for me. Like he made me think about applied philosophy. So like, oh, the stuff that I'd been reading, I could actually use at work as opposed to just reading philosophy. Um, and then he also had this amazing collection of books, which included Alicia Gerraro's book, uh, Dynamics in Action, which um, for me, I think I read like maybe maybe once a month. No, that's once, once every, once every year or two, I read that book. And it's, it's just every time I go through it, I find more there. Um, and that's been like just an, an incredible experience to kind of be able to work with her ideas um, and try to understand the implications in, in organizational theory and, and in design theory. So I don't know. Does that answer the question kind of? 
So you, you mentioned Alicia Juarero. Um, yeah. And um, I had a similar experience, I think, or from, from oh, no. Um, the experience I had when I first met this material, uh, it was kind of like this turn the world inside out. Like you, you have these cartoons where, um, yeah. well, no, that's kind of gruesome, uh, but <laughs> you know, where, yeah. where the, like people are just, oh my God, it's like flipped around. Yeah. Is, is that also, did you have that the first time you read it or, or how, how, yeah, did, you, um, how did it evolve? So I think there's a couple of things with Alicia's work for me. So I, you know, a lot of the work that I did in college was, was around Heidegger. Um, mm -hmm. And um, so there's, there's several different kind of things that end up showing up in relationship to Alicia's work mm -hmm. um, where she starts trying to tie together things like hermeneutics um, and, you know, the, the loops and self potentiation and things like that. Um, into more kind of scientific theories at the same time. So for me, part of the the like mind blowing part of working mm -hmm. with her stuff is that she is able to look at kind of like continental philosophy and science uh, epistemologies and you know more rigorous uh, analytic philosophy. And, and kind of pick and choose among them and still tell this uh, kind of incredible story. Uh, so her, 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 uh, her description of complexity is complex, right? Like it, it is a, it is a about the relationships between bunches of different ideas, I think. Um, and I think like to me reading her work partially, uh, you know, I, I have problems with rabbit holes. Um, <laughs> Mark might, might know what I'm talking about, but so for her, for reading her has been a very, engaged activity for me just because i mean she she goes into aristotle and then she goes you know she just it's such a broad palette that she works from um and i i tend to want to like go go and read it in the original sometimes and try mm -hmm. to come back and say okay so let me read it again and see if i get it a little bit better <laughs> this time um so uh that's that the the mind blowing part to me has always been like the way that she's managed to work all those things together. Uh, yeah, it's really interesting to me. Is is it? Um, I think this also is what makes it a little bit harder to get act, like like if unless, because you're a philosopher, so you have that background. Uh, for me, a lot of the words like. Um, epistemology i had to go and look up i did not sure, know yeah. what that is yeah. um it, it, do you get that same kind of or that was easy for you or you also no, I, and... yeah i mean i think the thing that like I, one of the things i would say about like uh philosophy for people who come to it for new mm -hmm. is that like <laughs> there's like epistemology there's not an agreement in philosophy on exactly what that term means. There's not an agreement on what ontology means, right? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, you know, you can go read uh, Heidegger's ontology and people will tell you that his ontology is a metaphysic and it, Heidegger's entire project was di disassembling metaphysics. So, you know, like I, there's that part, I think, um, is something you sh that people should be less afraid of when they approach work like Elysia's work. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that I love about Alicia, too, is Alicia, you know, Alicia taught in a community college. She taught normal, everyday people. <laughs> um, and the language in the book actually kind of flips back and forth between those very technical <laughs> things, but also like lovely little examples that are very kind of easy to play with in your head. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think that's that's another thing I really like about reading her work is that it it is um, it's a nice invitation into some very uh, difficult things to understand, but I think she does just a lovely job of kind of opening opening up the possibility that you could understand those things to you. And I think that's great. So, so how because you're also working in in software, you, you work at Red Hat. Yep. Um, how how does this play in your daily life? So you you said earlier already that you you it was really exciting that you could start using philosophy in in cool. in you know in your work life. Yep. Um, what what should I imagine with that? Like how does that go exactly? 
I think, well, I think again, you know, there's different parts of philosophy that I use regularly. So, you know, uh, understanding of rhetoric and understanding of argumentation and understanding how to build arguments, I think is just a hugely important uh, aspect of consulting, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there's that side of it, but the other side of it tends to be more like uh, what I kind of consider to be like model building or pattern finding mm -hmm. and, and working with others to do that, right? So for me, um, you know, as a, so I grew up as a kind of a, I read philosophy while I was a CTO and a chief architect, right? So a lot of the work that I was doing, you know, was around like trying to understand the world and then write down what the world was like in a very particular language, like maybe Java. Uh, and I, to me, this is not far uh, from a lot of kind of philosophical work that you might be doing. Like you need to understand the world. You have to write it down in a particular kind of argument uh, and it has to compile correctly. Like it's got to fit through these logic gates that you need it to fit through in order to be logical or reasonable or whatever. Um, and so I think there's like a, a play back and forth there where in software, it's about kind of that model building and that understanding the world. And then from there, talking to executives, it's about helping them understand how to create models about the world, how to create narratives and stories that help, help people to engage in, in the type of work that they want to get done, right? To build, you know, the term that I might use as a commons, right? Or a common ground. Um, and so like, you know, you can see things like um, the three economies that I talk about is, it's to me, it's a philosophical argument about how to build software in an, in an enterprise. Um, and, that, and it was built for that purpose. The purpose of talking about those things is to help people understand the relationships that they see inside of an organization in a way that they may not have seen them before. Um, and I, you know, when I work on that type of stuff, especially inside organizations, I always, <laughs> Eli Goldratt has this uh, idea where he says like, the best models, the best versions of these kind of philosophical arguments when you say them to someone, they should go, oh, that's, that's obvious. That's just, <laughs> why didn't I think about that that way mm -hmm. before? Um, and so, you know, that's, that's uh, the work of philosophy to me is to make, sometimes I talk about like the idea of like just waking up to what's already there. Um, mm -hmm. Like it's not, it's just that you haven't seen it before, right? It's right in front of your face. And then someone comes and like reveals it to you and you go, oh, right. Like that's not, yeah. So that's the type of work that I really like to be able to do with people. Um, and, you know, the, I try to do it uh, as a consultant and as a, as a software engineer and architect with people um, all over the world. So I'm, I'm blessed that people are willing to listen, listen to me rant about these ideas. So. <laughs> One of the big things for me was realizing that software systems, um, well, I, I'm, I'm, um, I'm feeling in the dark because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm still building up my vocabulary and, yep. and my idea space. And uh, I'm uh, probably less rigorous than you and, and Mark are in, in how you, how, how the models that you're creating and how, how you think about things. Um, but I'll, I'll do my best. Um, so, so one of the things that um, was a huge aha moment for me was to realize the software we are trying to create is deterministic systems that we can yeah. actually predict what's going to happen. And, and then um, the same mindset of, of trying to program the system and like and make it um, highly efficient and predictable that we've been taking this into organizations and there it just completely blows up. And for me, um, it, the, this was one of the key points that I got out of this constraint thinking. Mm -hmm. um, and is, is this something that is today already, how, how, do, you, how do you deal with that in, in, you, in yeah. your work life? Because bus business owners, uh, C-level, often think in ways of, you know, we need to control this and we, we need to make it predictable and, and um, uh, kind of like embracing, embracing the complexity 
is is not something that comes easy to a lot of people. How yeah. do you deal with that? I, I have like a couple different thoughts when I hear you talk about that. So the first one is the the last the the last like how do you deal with complexity or how do you deal with um, people's desire for determinism, right? Um, and so there's there's two things that come to mind when I think about that. The first one is like I love this phrase is from my friend uh, Andrew Clay Schaefer, and he says like people um, people want the assurance of mediocrity over probabilistic excellence. They'd rather have assured me- mediocrity than probabilistic excellence. That's like they're and they choose it all the time. And you know this is. Um, this causes lots of problems, and um, there's actually, I think, some reasonably good psychological uh, versions of this that you can get um, of uh, uh, ambiguity aversion and um, uh, uh, decisions under uncertainty. Um, and the, the idea here is that like people will pretty regularly choose a bad plan over no plan that has potential. So like, bring somebody something, and you say, here's a plan. Uh, and it might make us $100,000. We're not sure it will work, but it might make $100,000. But we have an idea that could make $10 million. No plan. People will choose the planned $100,000 thing that might fail <laughs> because there's a plan and there's less ambiguity and they don't like the ambiguity and they don't like the uncertainty. So I think there's something there, first of all. Um, the second version of it would be just this idea that... Um, in, in philosophy, um, it's called a pharmacon, um, and pharmacon, you should hear the word pharmacy, like mm-hmm. medicine. Um, and a pharmacon in philosophy is the idea that there's, there's certain things that if you don't have it, you get sick. It's like if you don't have the right medicine, you get sick. But if you take too much of it, it will kill you, right? Um, and complexity is a pharmacon. Like mm-hmm. no complexity, like the inability to work with any form of complexity assures you kind of stagnation and in any marketplace death, right? Like you don't have any options. So it's like complexity is where novelty comes from and innovation comes from. It's where new things happen because that's complexity. You know, sometimes I try to say like complexity is like about the future more than about the present. Um, yeah. it's, it's like... The, your ability to engage in it is about engaging in potentiality, right? Um, and so if you don't have any complexity, you end up dead. Um, if you have the right amount of complexity, right, you have to take the right amount of medicine, it can make you healthy, it can make you strong. And if you take too much of it, you get drunk on it, uh, and eventually you black out on it and you die, right? So, and I think um, part of the problem here is that you get, um, like in a lot of, situations you get the the problem of that missing middle idea people uh only see the extremes they want to either be highly deterministic or they want to avoid complexity altogether so both of them push you towards like simplifying systems in in a lot of ways without ever recognizing that kind of missing middle of like there's like a goldilocks amount of complexity to have in an organization and how do you get the goldilocks level in there um and you know some of the stuff I talk about with the three economies is about that, like complexity, investing your complexity across the organization um, in the right places. Some places, the complexity will pay off more than in other places. Mm -hmm. So have you thought through that? And can you think about how that works? Um, And then the last thing I'll just really quickly say, like um, is around like software being deterministic. And, and sometimes I like to say like, um, Software is a text that's being read by three agents. Like it's a it's it's a, it's a body of writing that's being consumed by three agents, right? And the three different agents are software engineers, right? Like the team that's actually writing the text and reading the text and modifying the text. Yeah. Um, and so there's there's a lot of work inside of what we call software architecture about improving um, the legibility of the text, like, you know, this is pattern languages and there's different ways of thinking about writing things and even different, you know, forms of language, like the difference between object orientation and function-based languages, right? Um, And all of those are about the making the text, the the code, 
accessible to a human agent yeah, uh, that's consuming it. The second consumer of the text is um, is your end user, like your, your the person who actually ends up using the system. Now they're not reading the text directly, but the text is materializing itself into this software system that they're interacting with, and so. Uh, you know, that ends up being tested and thought through by different kind of, you know, ways of testing. And, and we end up having unit testing and systems testing and integration testings and all of these things, because those are about making sure that the text aligns with the expectations of a consumer, the end user. Yeah? And then the last agent is the CPU. The CPU reads the text, right? And this is the ter deterministic version that you're talking about, right? So the determinism is that it the, the CPU has to be able to understand it, yeah? Now, that means that you have so, two social systems interacting with a deterministic technical system. It's a socio-technical system. It's a socio-technical system that's mediated through text. Um, and the text is the way that the social systems, which, you know, have a tendency to be a lot more complex um, in ways other than uh, you would think of like a deterministic system on the CPU. So you know, at the end of the day, the CPU doesn't see the text and the interactions as being complex. It's just doing math. <laughs> um, so in this way, like you have this really interesting idea, I think, about the way in which um, I think that often complexity is, I think there's examples of complexity in nature, let, let, but let's put that aside for two seconds. In artificial systems like software, the complexity we see there is because of the entanglement of human cognition in, this, in the ter deterministic system. The deterministic system outputs something that has no meaning to the CPU. It only has meaning to the engineers and the end users. And the engineers and end users are not deterministic systems. They're non-deterministic systems or complex systems. Yeah. So anyway, I think it's just like part of when we talk about socio-technical systems, part of what we're trying to do is saying that the activity of software engineering is the joint optimization of these three spheres of agency. The agency of the CPU, the agency of the, art, of the software engineer, and the agency of the consumer. Um, and that's, it needs to be jointly optimized. It can't, you can't optimize simply for the CPU. You can't optimize simply for the engineer. You can't optimize simply for the end user. And I think um, in, a lot of, in a lot of organizations, um, you know, the kind of like design-led organizations tend to overemphasize the customer and underestimate <laughs> the engineer. Engineers can frequently overemphasize the deterministic parts of it and underestimate the, you know, uh, consumer parts of it. So the, there's these weird like lack of joint optimizations that happen. And that's to me part of what we need to do better inside of organizations. And I, you know, I, I refer to this as socio-technical architecture. What I mean is architects and people trying to manage the whole system need to understand the multiplicity of agencies that are engaged in this mediated text that they're trying to manage. So anyway. Which is fascinating because basically, I, at least for me, this is kind of like opening up this image of thinking about software as just this deterministic thing. And it's like, it's just code, you execute it. Um, and then you've basically, you've just inverted the definition, which is now, well, actually, this is an interface between complex systems. And right. um and it's actually it's all about the complex systems rather than just just about you know what numbers that are being crunched in in the That's middle. Right. Yeah. Yep. Or, or you know the argument ends up being from social technical systems perspective that if you if you optimize one of the, one of those subsystems without considering the other, if you don't jointly optimize mm -hmm. it, you get a suboptimal result. You get a negative result. And so like you know the other version of this that I try to tell people like you you know like I was using this kind of language about the CPU having agency. And people are like, ooh, like that's weird. Like, what are you talking about? Like, sounds like neo-animism or like you think that the CPU thinks or has ideas or will or whatever. Um, well, I think like technical debt 
is an, a perfectly good example of the agency of a deterministic system, right? Uh, the agency is that uh, the software engineer wants to do something, but the code is like, that's not the easy way to do it. The easy way to do it is the way I want you to do it. I have an opinion about how this should happen, right? Now, of course, that's in some way, like someone stuck those ideas in the computer, but that doesn't mean that the mediated deterministic system isn't now pushing back on the human agency, right? So you get, and, and, and software engineers, I think, generally have a sense for this because they use all sorts of weird language to talk about code. They talk about code smells, right? Um, uh, or having bad taste, right? Like they use non-logical, non-rational descriptions of the way that code is. They talk about a sense of the code. Um, and so to me, all those things are trying to describe, again, the fact that the code or the material conditions that are established in the system have an impact on the decisions that the coders can make. Um, and w that means that, you know, again, we have to recognize that um, that is it's a jointly optimized system. It's not, you can't do just one. It can't do whatever you want in, in software. Um, and I think, like, again, I, you know, I talk about this stuff sometimes, but there was a huge amount when, when we talked a lot um, in the early 2000s about, like, knowledge work and these ideas. Uh, we talked a lot about, like, the intangibility of the product that we were making, right? We talked about the idea that you couldn't touch it and stuff like that. And I think that that misled a lot of people because there's a difference between intangible and infinitely flexible. Just because you mm -hmm. can't, like, touch it uh, doesn't mean that it's not solid, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it, and that it doesn't push back against you and have its own kind of weight and and the, that the interactions don't cause some sort of like stability or cohesion to happen. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, I think that's some of the stuff that we have to think through when we talk about, when we're trying to think about software engineering through kind of a complexity lens. In a previous interview with Matthew Reinbold, um, he said something really interesting is that um, he is aware of complexity, but he never talks about complexity, which which talks to what you said earlier about people being uncomfortable with it. Um, how do you manage that with your customers and your engagements? Do you talk about complexity with your customers or do you also use it as the secret sauce? Like, because I think, I think that it becomes kind of like your secret weapon, like, because you're okay to go into, into the madness and come back with the wisdom and then other people are not comfortable going into it. Um, is, is that also what you do or do you, have you found a way of talking about complexity that, that resonates with its customers? Um, so I, I do I like, uh, I like to lean into the, that idea when I'm talking to software engineers and things like that, I like to lean into the, so like when I talked about people um, having, like using terms like code smells and things mm -hmm. like that, right? Um, I, I usually refer to that that idea as like it's a phenomenological understanding. It's not a it's not a rational or logical understanding. It's like this is what it feels like. Um, and so when I talk to people about complexity or complicatedness, you know, different ideas, I tend to try to talk to them in those phenomenological terms, um, so that they have a sense of how their body reacts to uh, complexity, as opposed to uh, trying to help them understand ration the rational um, versions of it. Because uh, then I think if I can help them to recognize when they're experiencing complexity, then we can talk about what tools and ways of engaging with the complexity works like, right? So, you know, sometimes I say, like, complexity is, is almost the experience of complexity. Um, and I think, that, you know, to me, this is a really important uh, kind of version or aspect of it. The experience of complexity is doing a, a, a crossword puzzle. And the, the, the word is on the tip of your tongue is the way we say it in the, in the United States. It, like it's, I know if I keep thinking about this, it's going to come to me. It's, and so that experience of expectation that you will not, not that you know the answer, but you, that you know, you can arrive at an answer. That is the experience of complexity. That's the way people experience complexity when they work with a complex system. Um, and noticing that, like stopping and noticing that 
it's like it sometimes feels like a tightness in your chest or again like it's on the tip of your tongue type experience noticing that um and then going oh like like we're we're ha i'm having an experience that is about emergence right i'm not i and I, so i both need to kind of like not expect that i'm about like I can't simply expect that it's going to come to me right now. I have to let it emerge, but also like I should get other people involved in this and try to help them understand the way that I'm thinking about it because talking about it helps me to emerge the ideas and sketching it like, you know, so there's certain tools that end up being useful when you're in that state. Um, and, and that's the way that I try to talk to people, I think, about um, engaging in complexity. Otherwise, I use complexity theory as first principles for building models that are closer to what people would already be thinking about. So again, like, you know, um, the three economies concepts are complexity in informed, but I don't directly ever say, unless you want me to talk to you about it, <laughs> the complexity versions of it, right? I, mm -hmm. um, I don't explain how I got there. I only explain uh, the implications of the model that 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 I built. Um, so I think um, it's like it's like brand, blending blending the veggies into uh, a smoothie uh, to <laughs> trick the kids into eating the vegetables. Um, yeah. Uh, um, and then I think the other thing I would say is that this uh, I always so I've taught I don't know, 200, 300 enterprise architects all over the planet over the last eight years. Um, and some of them want to know, like, you're, the way that you arrived here is weird. How did you get here? And then you, then you can unwind the complexity and help them get back to the first principles and build the model back up from there. And some people really appreciate that. Um, and that helps them understand how to build other models. Right. So, um, yeah, I guess it's the question of like, uh, when you're consulting, are you trying to help them understand how to build models or are you trying to help them understand models so that they can use the models more effectively, if that makes any sense. So. I really want to hear this background story now, <laughs> but I don't know if you have time for that. And that's <laughs> the background story uh, of the three economies. Oh yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I was working in a Fortune twenty, and we were trying to install a with a product line model. Uh, so uh, we wanted to install a flow model, and at the same time, they wanted to increase efficiencies. Um, and it was highly, the, the product lines themselves were highly decentralized, as in like they had their own CTOs, like mm -hmm. it was big, big scale decentralization. And so I had to figure out a way to talk about concepts of federation, centralization, and, um, and decentralization. Like these, these are three big things that they needed to talk about and how they were related. Um, and I brought a lot of the work comes from reading, about, again, about social technical theory, but also kind of uh, reading a lot of Ashby's conceptions of the way that complexity grows in systems. And then um, also, I, like, I have these, you know, obviously, because it, it's called an economic model. I have these weird ideas about economies and um I wanted to have a way of describing investing and like what they were investing in. And eventually I came up with this insight that part of, part of the problem with Ashby that most, so Ashby's law is basically this argument that says like uh, every agent in a system, if the more complex the environment that, that they want to engage in, the more complex their internal model needs to be of that environment. So like basically get an internal mirroring of the external um, system. So like really, really quickly, old, old fashioned thermostat has like two registers, the current temperature and the ideal temperature, and it compares those two. And then it turns the, thermos, uh, therm, uh, the furnace on or off based on the comparison between those two things. So it's got two registers, very simple system. Mm -hmm. um, I have a nest. It keeps, keeps track of like the external temperature, the humidity, you know, it's got dozens if not hundreds of variables and the result of that is that it's much more efficient 
because it can curve the energy utilization closer to the environment because it knows more about the environment, right? So that's kind of the way that complexity um, increases. And so one of the, my like my insight one night was roughly I th that I think that most people think that that variability is just in the system. And what I thought about was, wait, what if there was a way of saying that the variability doesn't have to be like smeared across the system, that it instead could be invested in intentionally across the system? Would there be places where variability would be good? And would there be places where variability would be bad? And then you get kind of, and, and the really interesting uh, kind of subversion of this is that there's in, inside of Toyota, there's a weird thing called 4VL. Um, and in there, uh, the Vs uh, re refer to the difference between variation and variability. Mm. Um, and so variation is good and variability is bad. So what's the difference between these two things? Well, variation is the intentional creation of difference. We want different variations of our car models. We, that's good. It allows us to tune our system to the marketplace. Variability is the unintentional creation of difference inside the system. Bad. We don't like this because it increases costs and lowers efficiencies and causes defects and things like that, right? So it's noticing that the difference inside of a system is, is valued inversely, right? In some parts of the system, it's good. In some parts of the system, it's bad. So now you get a model that says, okay, so what we want to do is squeeze the variation out of certain parts of it and ex and basically allow it to exist in other parts. And then I, you know, my argument ends up eventually being that uh, like anything, because again, this is a kind of, I think a common conception of complexity. A system can only be so complex before it collapses. Like the people can't manage it anymore because it's too complex. Well, this means that you, there's a budget well, there's a limit to the amount of complexity that your system can have, which means that it's an economic decision because the limit is what makes it an economic decision. It means that you have to budget it. And so instead of budgeting it across the whole system, intentionally invest it across the system in appropriate ways, and then you get benefits from it instead of just smearing it across the system like most people do. So, and I think there's some really interesting, uh, when we talk about APIs or platforms, which we should do at some point. Um, I think there's some really interesting implications in what happens when you don't invest correctly. Um, anyway, so. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Mark, I'm just going to sit here for a while. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to add the link to the three economies to the show notes so <laughs> okay, that people thanks. can then actually pick it up. Um, but Underneath the, the three economies, there's also, you talked about it just quickly earlier, it might be worth going a bit deeper on uh, your understanding of the commons. Yeah. Um, it's also probably quite important in understanding current climate, uh, politically in the world, et cetera. Sure. Um, could you maybe explain a little bit how complexity and the commons, um, how they hang together? Sure. Um, so, uh, like, uh, if there's three economies, uh, which in the model there are, because that's why I call it the three economies, um, the three economies that we talk about are called differentiation, uh, scope, and scale. Um, and w the really quick version of this is that in most organizations, um, there is a, there's a dichotomy. They only have two ways of managing the system. They only understand two different economic theories, differentiation, uh, often like called innovation in organizations, uh, like any, any, any activity around product ownership or product management or design led or innovation, all those things are differentiation economy ideas. The idea is that you create value in this economy by creating something that's unique in a marketplace that's novel or different that, and you know, basically it thinks about the world as a customer comes and compares two things and picks one of them and if they can't differentiate between the two, you're not doing a good job in that marketplace. You should differentiate your product from the other products, right? That's differentiation, right? Um, scale is the other common one that everybody knows about. This is when your boss comes and says, like, we need to be more efficient. 
Um, we need to be able to do, do more with less is another kind of common phrase, right? Um, and you'll see this often in operations and there's specific reasons for that in operations, um, which we can get into a little bit at, at some point, but it's highly repeatable tasks where the repetition allows for the perfection, uh, where I don't mean literally getting too perfect, but like the refinement of the process and the ability so that it squeezes waste out. Um, the naive understanding of lean, I think, would be that what we're talking about here, right? Like, a high, like Six Sigma style lean, right? Um, and then scope um, is a is a different argument. Um, it requires understanding a really interesting idea, I think, uh, which has to do with this, this idea called the tragedy of commons. And so the tragedy of commons basically argues that um, imagine you're in a town and everybody has cows and there is a common pasture. And for years, you've all agreed. No rules. Like, it's not like there's some sort of town council that did this. It's just like you agree amongst yourselves, like everybody can have one cow and we'll all share the pasture. And it's worked out for years. And then some, so at some point, some guy comes along who's more sophisticated in uh, capitalistic uh, frames of how to uh, leverage marketplaces and goes, Let's see here. If I put three cows on the field, the field might collapse or people might abandon the field. It's hard to tell what's going to happen. Either way, I'll have three cows. Everybody else have one cow. And even if I destroy the field, I'm still up two cows for everybody else. Um, so screw it. I'm, I'm taking over the field. Nobody's there to stop me. And it causes the field to collapse. Right. And then all the cows starve. Then nobody has cows. But the guy who started this activity uh, temporarily had the advantage, right? Um, and this is a, a problem that we see in a lot of work, uh, places. Um, there's uh, some really interesting aspects to the, to the whole story. First of all, the the person who came up with tragedy commons was like a blatant racist, and he was actually trying to argue that like people should not be allowed to immigrate into the United States because the United States was a commons that would be overrun by people who were not responsible. Um, so like it's a, it's in its original form was an entirely racist argument, which is interesting. Uh, but the second thing is this, like when we think about it, one of the qualities that ends up being really interesting is that it's talking about a system where uh, use causes consumption. So use is like doing a thing and consumption is that when you use the thing, it goes away. And so tragedy of commons is limited to systems where the resource under management is consumed in use, right? So in IT, the stuff we all do, um, or stuff that at least the three of us do, I don't know what people do on the, are listening, um, those are specific resources, CPUs, uh, networks, disk drives. You can overwhelm your CPU capacity, you can overwhelm your network capacity, you can overuse your disk capacity. Those are all exposed to the tragedy of the commons. If you don't regulate their use with some sort of centralized scale-based economy, they will be overconsumed. Um, and of course, there's the opposite of that, right? If you, if you just go out and buy willy-nilly, buy up all the disk drives on the planet, then you're likely to have over-invested in capacity and underused the capacity, which is also bad, right? So, um, Things that can be consumed are exposed to those types of market risks, right? Now, there's a whole other set of things that don't work like that. Um, they don't get consumed in use. And uh, my argument um, in the three economies is that these things end up being things that um, look like software patterns, um, APIs, uh, common functions, data, um, cloud native patterns, right? Why? Well, if someone, like if you have a centralized data store, if people, if, if, if bunches and teams all start talking and referring to the same customer data, does that make the data less valuable? Does it, get, does it go away if all the teams are using it? No, it doesn't go away at all. But it actually becomes more valuable. So you have a system in your organization where use is not consumptive and increases value. So some parts of the system are 
de degrade in value when they're overused and can be overconsumed. Some things cannot be overconsumed and actually increase in value as they're consumed, right? Um, so the scope economy is based on that. And then the idea of commons is that the easy way to build a commons inside of an organization is to focus on these non-consumables, these, these things that increase in value in, in use. And the argument for the, for the kind of transitionary phase inside of the three economies is to say this, if you only had the first two economies in your organization, you only had differentiation and scale, those are the only ways you would think about things. It, and you and you acknowledge that there's some things that that are non-consumable and gain value in use. It means that you've been using the wrong economic paradigm and undervaluing some part of your system. Yeah, um, and you should find those things and move them into the commons, uh, the scope economy. And that is, in most organizations, a platform. You should make a platform, and you should put those things on the platform. Uh, you should make them easily accessible. You should lower the barriers to entry. You should accelerate use. Um, the, all those things end up being ways of unlocking a huge amount of value in assets and resources that your organization already has. It's just using the wrong economic methods to manage them. So. The two ways you see it as being wrong in most organizations is either you're managing with central IT uh, and you're managing as if it's a consumable resource, so you're restricting access to it. So there's all sorts of policies and change review boards and nonsense that prevent people from getting access to the things or slow the access down, makes, makes it a pain in the ass to get. So like... Basically, uh, you'll see a lot of this, uh, the naive version of this is being like self-service access is the first step towards a lot of this. Like just remove the barriers to getting access to these non-consumable resources, right? So that's one thing. And the other one is like shadow IT, uh, right? So these are, these are resources that are being managed in a differentiation economy because, because the teams inside the differentiation economy cannot access the things inside the scale economy fast enough, so they build their own. But then you get lots of parallel versions of the same thing owned by lots of different teams, and you get variation inside the organization in a non-valuable way because that variation isn't targeted towards the market. It's targeted towards the infrastructure of your company. And that's bad variation as we defined it at the beginning, right? So what we do uh, in theory is we go through the organization, we try to identify all those shadow IT or uh, pieces, those are things that should be put over onto a platform. We try to find all the things that are being managed by central IT that are not consumable, and we try to expose those in some sort of self-service access. Once we get there, then we start doing things like applying patterns to it so that we're minimizing the variation uh, a little bit further by not only deduplicating, which is frequently what people kind of hear this as, but it's not just deduplicating the resources themselves. It's actually limiting the number of configurations um, so that you get less cyclomatic and uh, polymorphic complexity. So you don't like have an explosion of the different ways that the components get put together. So like, well, you know, one of the things I say to people sometimes is like, Lots of organizations go out and they think that Amazon uh, AWS is a platform and Amazon is not a platform. Amazon is infrastructure as a service. They give you access to primitives. It's up to you in your organization to determine how those primitives fit together. That's what a platform is. Platform is how the primitives fit together in a commonly understood way so that people can not create all sorts of permutations of the way that they interact, but already have a predefined set of ones. And, you know, again, I think there's market forces at play. That's why Amazon is, exposes primitives. It's because that's, they don't want to declare themselves like a banking platform. They make lots of money by not declaring themselves a banking platform and just giving access to primitives, com composable bits. Now you get like, okay, well, how do we compose those things? That's your platform. The, com the, com the opinionated composition of primitives is the platform um, to, to a certain extent. So anyway, um, and that's the commons. And the, the challenge here, I think, is, is 
for most organizations and why commons and commonsing is challenging is because um, most organizations, even uh, organizations that do agile and all these kind of more advanced or kind of uh, in vogue ways of working are still team-based and they're often highly focused on the differentiation economy. And so the result is that teams very rarely are ever asked to consider how to share the creation and maintenance of a resource. They don't know how to do it very well. Most organizations have very few ideas about how to do it, right? Um, so to me, um, like for instance, I don't think when, when you look at, um, and again, I, you know, Amazon from a business perspective, at least profits wise, seems to be perfectly successful. So this just proves there's lots of ways to organize things. But to me, the kind of cell based structure of Amazon, the like pods that only interact through APIs, there's no, there, that means there isn't really uh, commons there. There's just direct interactions of cells at that point. A commons would be that they have a way of contributing to a central shared resource um, that they're managing all together. And I do think, for instance, that places like Google clearly have uh, a more of a commons-based theory uh, of operations. Like they build a platform that everyone shares. Um, you can see this in like their cookie cutter or architecture concepts, but also you can see it by the emergence of Kubernetes inside, you know, which was originally Borg inside of Google, which is to me, again, response to complexity. So the thing that I often say is um, the reason why platforms emerge naturally inside of an organization is because they reach a tipping point of complexity where they can no longer manage the complexity that's being generated by the differentiation teams. And they need a choke point, a way of like down, like I usually call it like a gearbox. And the platform is a way of downstepping the complexity a little bit so that the infrastructure has an opportunity to do scale-based anything, right? Because otherwise you get just too much differentiation all the way back into the scale economy. Um, and I think that the reason why you see a lot of organizations struggling right now um, and working with platforms is the same reason that Ber Borg emerges at uh, Google. A certain level of complexity causes platforms to be required for the system to be operable. Otherwise, there's the complexity gets smeared, like I was talking about, right? Um, and so what we're having right now in a lot of organizations is, you know, I think that early internet, the first version of this kind of commonsing was open source. So you, the internet reaches a level of complexity, interactions reach... Where you have, where you get a emergent property of that network being open source projects, right? Google reaches that same tipping point and has a different answer to it, which is Borg, which is a similar way of like dealing with the complexity and downgrading it. Um, and now, what you're seeing in organizations all over the world is that they are arriving at that tipping point of complexity. Their systems are getting so complex that they cannot continue to manage them without adopting some sort of platform. Um, and that's what's happening. They're not doing it because it's a cool idea. They're doing it because there's no other way to manage the systems. So Matter that was a long ra rambling answer, but. You use their uh, concept called, you named the downgrading the complexity. Um, so I haven't talked to you before. I know that this is something very different from what most organizations actually try to do when they face complexity. So what most also tech leadership often advocates is actually ways of reducing it. Yeah, that's right. And what they go after, obviously, is often the artificially human-induced complexity that we don't need, so management overheads and other stuff yeah. um, that we don't need to talk about. But I think would be interesting to understand what you mean with downgrading. So how is that different from reducing complexity? Yeah, so let, uh, let, uh, I want to like try to paint a little picture and see if I can get you guys to think about it in, just kind of verbally. Like, So when I think about this, think about the platform. Platform has a certain quality. So like, there's many teams um, and the many teams are all addressing different niches inside of a market, right? Like there's like someone in a bank, there's someone who's high net worth clients, uh, retail banking, uh, you know, whatever. 
they have all sorts of different niches that they're trying to deal with. And so, um, in theory, uh, they need access to computers and networks and databases. And then, then they could build their own system from scratch. Each of them could build their own system from scratch. Obviously, this seems like eventually maybe not the best idea, but you know, you could do it. Uh, at some point, there's a certain level of complexity that it, it gets involved where like, I want to transfer from a retail bank, my, I want to transfer my retail account to the high network worth account because I won the lottery or something like that. Um, and this starts happening more and more frequently and the interactions between the systems become more and more aggressive and entangled. And then people start going, okay, we can't do this thing where each product line has access just to primitives. What we need is to have a, some way of choking or downgrading the complexity where we share some of the resources. So for instance, let's try to centralize or common the, um, the user accounts so that at least Jabe isn't spewed across like 10 different databases in different shapes and stuff like this, right? So then we go off and we start building a platform to share data or something like that, right? Um, now, I want you to think about the idea um, being that what happens in organizations when the platform isn't like easily accessible and easily easy to use is that the differentiation economies, because they're so tightly bound to market cycle times, if they can't get what they want within a market cycle time, they'll go around the platform and build uh, against the primitives anyway. And what ends up happening, instead of having a downgrading of the complexity where the complexity in the organization or the variation in the organization gets smaller um, and less as we move more and more towards infrastructure, what ends up happening is the complexity literally skips the platform aspects and leaks into the infrastructure groups, right? Um, and the result of this to me is, is interesting. And I, again, it's the thing that I don't think people think about well enough is that there's two cycle times in, in, in your organization. The platform is generally isolated from them. Um, it's one of the reasons why a platform is an interesting kind of place inside of an organization. So platforms don't, often don't directly touch, touch the market. They're, they're isolated from the uh, purchasing side of the market by infrastructure, right? In other words, the people who buy from the market are in your ops department. And the people who sell to the market are in your differentiation economy. So the, the platform itself ends up being kind of isolated from the market. There's, of course, uh, the idea that your platform might be directly consumed by a marketplace. But let's leave that to the side because I think that there's different ways to deal with that. But anyway, the result of this is this, is that this, what are the cycle times for buying like hardware? Like they're really big loops compared to different, in a differentiation economy, like two weeks, daily, whatever, like they spin real fast, right? Well, your, your uh, infrastructure department like wants to replace their routers every three years, wants to replace the CPU uh, pool every two years. Uh, they want to know how much you're going to consume so they don't over purchase, but they also don't want to under purchase because they get penalized for over and under purchasing. So these cycle times are important, right? Um, and if you entangle the two, right? Um, what ends up happening is you tie the hands of the differentiation economy uh, by saying, like, you need to upgrade Oracle right now. You, don't, you run out of chances. you got to upgrade Oracle right now. Um, and the product owner comes back and is like, I'm about to miss, like, the Christmas marketing window. And they're like, I don't care. you got to do it, right? So that's the one way it can happen. The other way is what happens a lot. The differentiation economy overrides the operations infrastructure. You need to go out and go to eBay and buy every three, uh, X386 processor on the marketplace because we can't find any more and we're not going to upgrade the software that runs on it. So you absolutely have to go purchase this wacko stuff that we're overcommitted to, right? Because there's a direct tie between the applications and the infrastructure itself, right? Or... Uh, I'm I'm in operations. I'm going to buy you. I'm going to, we're going to move from um, spindle disk to RAM based, uh, you know, or, or you know, silicon disks, and uh, it's going to like radically change the way you should be using your database indexing. 
Well, what, what if you're so you know stuck inside of your market timings that you're not able to do that? Well, the whole idea of the platform is that those that stuff happens on the platform level because the platform level is to some extent isolated from the the um, the market itself. Yeah? Uh, so there's there's a team that's living there. That's negotiating, like upgrading your Oracle databases, uh, you know, making, you know, re-indexing your databases to use the new disk drives, blah, 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 blah. Um, and so that you get this idea that, you know, that part of the organization ends up being the part of the organization that enables these other two to operate in their native or natural cycle times. And you don't, in theory, you stop paying the cycle time or the market timing costs that happen when these two things get entangled, right? Um, so wh what we're trying to do is we're trying to create a natural way in which this, the, the variation that we have in the differentiation economy is consuming slightly less variability in the platform. And what I mean by that is that like, again, Let's consume the, the let's consume the primitives from our ops department in predefined patterns where the differentiation teams have to give me a very explicit um, you know business reason why they should be able to configure the primitives in different ways or to request different primitives, right? So that we then maintain this isolation between these two, we can upgrade the primitives in the cycle time different than that. If we don't get that to happen and we don't get the adoption of the platform to happen, the, these teams will go around the platform and start directly consuming um, the, uh, the, the primitives again, and you'll end up with the cycle times tied up because they'll get temporary advantage out of it, but they won't get long-term advantage out of it. I don't know if that answered the question, but that's that's the idea that I have in my head when I talk about that, the way you want to kind of like step down the complexity. That's it for the first part of our interview with Jay Bloom. In the second part, we go deeper on how organizational design is still stuck in organizational engineering, how to get beyond that, and how we have to rethink our understanding of roles. Jabe also explains Alicia Juarero's term of neurological recursions using high school cliques. How do complex systems stabilize towards heterarchies of mediated interactions between coexisting hierarchies within the organization? And finally, how this all informs creating APIs that enable the emergence of higher level constructs. If you want to learn more about Jabe's thinking, I recommend you search for his name on YouTube and Vimeo and any other video streaming platform. Thank you for listening and until next week, please mind your context.